Hello, everybody. This is Jersey Joe of the Heads Up Hockey Podcast. Sports are coming back, and only SportsBetMVP.ag has all the perks you're going to look for. A 125% sign-on bonus, $25 risk-free bet, and daily payouts. The promo code... For the podcast is social, S-O-C-I-A-L. And thank you for supporting the Heads Up Hockey podcast. Well, hello, everybody. This is Jersey Joe of the Heads Up Hockey podcast and your co-host today, Parker Warner. Hey there, Good. So this is going to be a little like recap of day one and day two, or however we want to put it today. Uh, yeah, just day one and day two because day three is not technically up as we are recording this. So just like to um, summarize. Get through what? We'll... Sorry. I was going to say we are going to summarize um, what day one and two brought um, us yesterday and today. I mean, the days before, technically. Yep, August August 1st and 2nd. Yeah, Tempest Fugit, or as, as they say in Latin, time flies. <laughs> so Yeah. I must say, what's the most interesting uh, game you've watched thus far the past two of three days? Um... Well, I um, just got – I know this contradicts what I just said like 30 seconds ago, but I just got done with the uh, the Tampa and um, Washington game, and I <laughs> I almost had a heart attack because uh, they, they went into overtime, and a buddy of mine was saying that, like, there's a bunch of no calls on the, on, on the caps, and I couldn't see him, but he was upset about him, <laughs> and uh, – Kucherov with the uh, a quick one two, and then underneath the the uh, glove of the of um, Holpe. Holpe, was it? I I keep I keep thinking Wilson, but Wilson's the one that keeps hitting um, people, hitting people. <laughs> yeah, he he's been known for that. I mean, he's a big specimen. You look at him; he's the kind of guy that makes you think of a modern day forward version of Scott Stevens. Oh, yeah, sure. Someone that really does strike fear in today's game. Um, I wanted to touch on um, the Carolina versus the Rangers earlier. Um, we know right now they're up two to nothing on the best of five. What do you take out of the past two games that they played? Well, I thought the first game was better than the second game. Um I actually watched the first game while I was working and I kind of just glanced over every, every so often, but I feel like they were just more, New York was more of a well-rounded team um, in the first game. But uh, today it was just all over the place. The defense couldn't do anything. And if Lundquist wasn't Lundquist, then it would have been a much higher score. I think I have a reasoning for why the Rangers are a little out of sorts with their penalty kill and their defense. You know how the, we talked about Lindy Ruff now being the coach of the New Jersey Devils? Well, uh, they had to replace Lindy Ruff with another coach from Hartford. So they had to do their due diligence um, to shore that bench up. And it's really showing the past two games that – the Rangers have been able to establish a full-time lead or get a lead. And it's really starting to show. I mean, we're seeing that um, Carolina has been picking up the pace and they've been really putting the full throttle on. It just seems like they're really going for the kill. Yeah. Uh, with, with uh, Shvesnikov and um, his hat trick. Um... And Sammy Botton. Mm-hmm. Those two are really becoming, you know, forces in the league. Um, I know Svetsingov is like 20 years old. Do you know how old um, 
Uh, I'm actually, news. I'm a, funny thing you mentioned. Um, I'm I'm going on to Cap Friendly just to double check. Um, yeah, it's not just about salaries; it's also about players' age and timing. Um, let's see, Sveshnikov is 20 years old. Mm-hmm. So he'll be 23 by 2021, 2022 season uh, when he's an RFA. And then uh, Botnin, how, how old is he? Sammy is 29 years old, and he's up until the 2020, 21 season. So th- this is a perfect timing for Carolina um, because a lot of their guys who are locked up long term, like Jay Gardner that they traded for, uh, Brady Shea, who had a really good game, mm-hmm. Jacob Slavin are all under contract all the way through 2022-2023 as their core defense. Um, just looking at those contracts. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Brady Shea uh, from my neck of the woods, uh, U of M graduate. Um, and what do you see in Brady Shea's game that reminds you of his younger days out near you in Minnesota? Um, his just aggressiveness on the puck. Um or like on the aggressiveness on the puck when he's on defense, I should say. Like he's he was what I noticed is that he was always um, just right, just body to body in in the corners, and he was never like a guy to like get in position. He was always just there's the puck, let's go for it. You know, he was very aggressive. He was very aggressive, and that's. Which is just what I saw today. I also saw a lot of aggression in the the Tampa Washington game, but yeah. And so I wanted to elaborate on. I was listening to the live feed because I was out and about. Um, I was trying out my new bike, and I was also having, you know, some good drinks uh, outside in the city of Asbury Park. You know, great beach day. Uh, I was listening to Eddie Olchek, and he was talking about how Brady Shea was being so aggressive, as you touched on. And Joel Edmondson has been the kind of defenseman who's been getting in the lane. And I'm looking at all these defensemen that Carolina has, and there's a bunch of left-handed defensemen, yet they only have just a few uh, right-handed shots. Um, guy, a guy from uh, Middletown, New Jersey, Trevor Van Riemsdyk, who won uh, the recent Stanley Cup with the Chicago Blackhawks. I was actually at his Stanley Cup party, and he's been a very serviceable guy uh, for Carolina since moving on from Chicago. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. He's, again, it's all about, like, those pieces. Like, that's why Carolina – has been doing so well in the past. Well, last year they were they're in the playoffs, um, and uh, you know it's 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 about the pieces. Like when um, I think I said this earlier, like when you get when you have guys like well, just you know uh, Svetsnikovs and uh, Brantman, and then uh, uh, P- uh, Mer- Peter Merzak had a very good game as well. Um, but, you know, like the addition the um, secondary guys like. Uh, Nino Niederreiter and Trevor Van Riemsdyk, you know, you just create that whole team, like, you know, you just create the whole team dynamic. And that's, I think what, what, I think that's the reason why Carolina is so successful. Does that, does that, does that make sense? What I'm- yes, it does. Oh. And you, and it's all about your pro scouts that you have at the NHL games and they're evaluating um, the NHL rosters. Then you have a few minor league guys who go game to game and they search for the best available guys that no one really thinks about in the middle of those trades. Like, you know how the doubles did the Yanni Kwokunen deal. How many people think of Yanni Kwokunen? We're off the top of their heads. Not very many people. Um, This is why when a team doesn't do as well or mediocre over the years, they piece together. And Carolina has been doing that the past couple seasons. And it's showing that, you know, they were able to keep the Rangers at bay the past two games, despite an Artemi Panarin scoring along with 
uh, Dylan Strom, I mean, Ryan Strom, sorry, and uh, Tony D'Angelo from Sewell, New Jersey. So the Rangers do have a potent lineup. It's just that how can they manage it without um, Lindy Ruff at the helm uh, as an assistant coach there? Um, well, uh, on paper, like you're saying, um, you know, like on paper, it looks like the Rangers should be like, a, you know, a Stanley Cup team every year. Guys like Zibanejad, Panarin, D'Angelo, Truba, uh, Buchnevich, uh, Kreider, who just signed a seven-year deal. And young guys like Aaron Fox and Kapo. Kapo, Kapo. Uh, Adam Fox, who – who was say? a recent uh, Carolina Hurricane, and he didn't want to – well, he was a prospect, and he didn't want to be with Carolina because he felt that, you know, he wouldn't have a job. And he wanted to leave there um, coming out of Harvard and because I had Molly Walker on, and, you know, she pointed out that he wanted to be with the Rangers. So it goes to show you that, you know, Carolina did get something in return for him, and – you know, the Rangers right now, they're in a hole. So it just goes to show you not everything on paper looks great. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's, it's all about, you know, the team dynamic and what, what works. And um, like uh, the wild, they put on an absolute showing and like on paper, you know, um, for like just your average fan that's not in Minnesota. Right, you're thinking, oh, Preezy, Fiala, Suter, you know, like, oh, I know those guys, but like, who are all these other guys on the team? Right, like the together? Jordan Green Greenways. See, exactly. And when you put it together and you have that dynamic, you can go on to win three zero against Vancouver. <laughs> In Vancouver, I mean, they on on paper, like you think, you know, with Quinn Hughes around that you would have this extra potency of a very supportive and attacking fast playing offensive defenseman who could be the Calder uh, trophy winner, but yet um, that wasn't present in that game versus the wild where it was a very tight defensive game and it could have gone either way. Uh, Not to sound biased against Minnesota, but, uh, Minnesota really did a great job keeping Vancouver at bay. Yeah, everything um, for Vancouver was was difficult. Like everything, if just even just getting point to point or not point to point from from north to south, and you know, um, it, was, it was it was hard for them to do that. And just every everything just just came difficult. And when that um, builds up, you know, through multiple periods, it's just going to get worse and worse. And that's why you saw the uh, result that you did, you know, stay locked with the 28 saves and um, just the victory, the, the victory in general. And then it reminds me of the Coyotes versus Predators game. And, you know, if I was into betting and I will uh, plug this in uh, for anyone who's going to place bets on uh, sportsbetmvp.ag. Uh, use promo code SOCIAL, S-O-C-I-A-L. Um, yeah, they are an affiliate. We are an affiliate with them. Uh, they are a sponsor, so I had to do a cheap plug right there. Um, so what I wanted to throw in there, if I, if I was going to place a bet, I would have done it against Na- Nashville because it's John Hines and how other way can I really slice it? Um, in the playoffs, the devil's only got one playoff uh, win against Tampa Bay in 2017, 2018. And I know this is a play in round, but it's treated as a playoff round uh, format wise. And this is where I think things get really tricky versus Nashville, despite all the big names they have. Um, yeah, I, um, <laughs> it's 
the the dynamic in Nashville, I guess again, like it. Neither team played like ex- exceptionally well. Um, I, I guess I guess I don't understand like your your question. I'm sorry. Like, uh, you just. I was. Let me kind of rephrase it. Like, um, having me knowing the history of John Hines as the coach of the Devils in recent years, and he's the coach of the Predators now. Um, for me, you know. He seems a lot more predictable historically, and I said if I was going to place a bet, it would be uh, the Coyotes beating the Predators last night because you know this could, this is one of those games that could go up in the air because you don't know if every team's star player is going to be showing or you know Hines mismanages the the Nashville Predators or they just get bad bounces. Oh, okay, that that makes more sense. Yeah, like with that history uh, in the Devils or- organization, um, it's it's really tough to say just because he's is a relatively new coach. You know, like you said, twenty seven, seventeen, eighteen with the Devils. Um, well, he he started in two thousand fifteen, taking over for Peter DeBoer, who was fired. Um, you know, the year before, and there was an interim. Uh, coach at the time and so um, Hines got fired a few few months into um, this past season or the current season um, excuse me I mean I know it's playing around but um, he got re- replaced by Elaine Nazardine now Nazardine replaced by um, Lindy Ruff so what I'm saying is, is that um, Hines's overall record isn't really that great, but he has won a lot of games over the years, improving the Devils. But um, do I think he's the best coach um, for the Nashville Predators? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I think he's really good with veteran players, but I don't know if he's really good with younger players. Yeah, for sure. And I guess only time will tell. I mean, you know, you've got, veteran guys who have, you know, a veteran presence on the team like uh, Grandland, um, Duchesne, Desch- he's how old is he? Is he like- Matthew Duchesne. Duchesne is, yeah. Country boy. Um, the Coyotes did win that night, and it, and it was pretty close, but um, it could have gone either way still. Yeah, in the, in the third period, they really – you know, they scored once in the second period, once in the third period, yeah, because I remember I was on my way to a buddy's in, in the middle of that that whole thing. I got there, and it's 3-4. It's like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so um, we're moving on to the Flyers-Bruins. Um, Yaroslav Halak started in net over Tuka Rask, and it was basically all Flyers from the start to finish where, uh, no pun intended, finish, if you know what I mean, to yeah. Garask. Yeah. Um, Yaroslav Halak uh, just didn't have a good game with the defense in front of him and the offense in front of him. Although you can say, excuse-wise, that they looked a little lame coming out of the gates, but it just seemed the Flyers wanted the game more. Well, you know, I think it's because of um, Carter Hart's uh, his goaltending. I think that's a lot of what happened. You know, it, um, they just could not get into the net. Hart looked super cool. You know, he just calm, cool, collected, and he just wouldn't let anything by him except that one goal. And um, yeah, it's just a matter of you know who, which team has it together more and. You know, clearly it was, it was Philly, but, and you know, there was a couple, one of the things I will tell you from a metropolitan standpoint, not just as a devil's fan, but um, anytime I hear the name Philadelphia Flyers these days, it always means we're going to play physical. We're going to play rough. We're going to play dirty and we're going to be up your, you know what? And 
that's just the way Philly plays. And with Carter Hart there, he's trying to emerge as that, I'm going to be here for a long time, super stable goaltending genius. Um, the Metropolitan has a lot of great goaltenders. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Flyers do edge out the Bruins, but the Bruins could come back from their slumber like a real bear and actually win this play in round. Yeah, there's there's a lot of good talent on the Bruins. Um, Krug, McAvoy, Bergeron, Marshall. I mean, really, you can talk about them all day. Uh, it, they're they're a solid team, and I I do think that there there will be you know a, a series there. I don't think it's just going to be Flyers one two three. Um, I, I I think the Bruins are gonna are gonna win the the, the next game personally. Um, I can see especially Patrice Bergeron is one of those really good two way talented forwards who's always been a really good Selkie candidate and won it multiple times and um, I just think he's gonna help be a key difference in that series besides Brad Marchand. Yeah, Marshawn is just like your physical, your physical get in there guy, and I think Bergeron is like that cool collected. Well, don't get me wrong, Bergeron's physical, but you know that cool collected um, Prince Edward Island boy does it right. Does all the little things right, and and that's why it uh, that's why it works. Dude, you got to be six. Um, you got to be six feet away or two meters apart from him because he might lick you. mm Hmm. Yeah, so I don't want to get too disgusting, but I do want to talk about how disgustingly awesome that uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs fell. And I couldn't hear a, a leaf fall because the Blue Jackets were were silencing the Leafs last night, two to nothing. How about that? Well, it. Um... You know, I, that's I watched the first and second period of that. I think just both teams just – I think that was just a sloppy game. Honestly, from just what I saw, it was just it was just bad. I, I thought it was bad hockey. And then um, I, I was on the road. It was like 9, nine o'clock my time. And um, I just – I was on the road, so I didn't see that first goal. Um, and then somebody said um, – another uh, empty net goal in in the third. So it, I mean, I guess it's not, it's, it's just a lot of sloppy play and then something worked for Columbus. They got that one goal and then again, some more sloppy play. Then they took um, Anderson out of the, out of the net and then empty net goal. Same thing happened in the wild game. They took Markstrom out of the net and Spurgeon scored a empty net goal. Right. And you know what? I'm, I I will say this. Um, I'm a big fan of great goaltending, and you you can say you know it was a boring game, but you know when you think of like playoff style format, usually goaltending is the first thing you should think of. And I spoke with Dave McCarthy a few episodes ago. Um, what do you think about? Uh, Jonas Corposalo and Elvis Merzlikens going up against Freddie Anderson and the team in front of uh, Columbus. And you know what he said was, you know, he's hoping Freddie Anderson is the Freddie Anderson of uh, the middle late season form versus the early season form Freddie Anderson where uh, he's not as good. But Freddie Anderson looked pretty sharp as just that the first goal that he gave up just happened to be the only one he would let up, you know, not as a empty net goal, but you do see the brilliance behind Jonas Corposalo uh, on that huge save versus Matthews. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, it was, I'm trying to think of what, um, is that? I don't know. Like, like, like you said, a um, lot, a lot of it is goaltending. Um, like we saw yesterday with with that Toronto Columbus game. Um, 
a lot, a lot, a lot of great stops. Um, just like in any any other game, there's a lot of games, though a lot, of, a lot of shots that probably should go in, but the goaltending, it's just too, 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 too good for that shot. And um, yeah, just having to stop it at at the right time. And and what did you think of Edmonton being down by? Uh, Chicago with the likes of Dominique Kubalik, the Plajin Czech Republic native. Yeah, that was crazy. It there was like fifteen. It was like fifteen minutes in, and there's already been five goals. It's four to one Chicago, with like five minutes left in the first period. It's ridiculous. Absolutely mad that game was. Um, that was just. I was insane. I, I was. I was, That's one of the games that I was working at too. Um, I was working during that game. I did see part of it, and then I then I switched over to the the Islanders Florida game. Um, just because four to one Chicago, I <laughs> it's like ah, oh, get out of here, you know? Because like, there's no right away. I kind of noticed that um, you know, home ice advantage just didn't it it didn't exist for the playoffs. You know, because that's kind of what I thought. I wrote an article about this earlier, how, like, maybe the fact that they're in Edmonton and they're in their own stadium, maybe that will play part in it, part in it but... Very little. That first period, that... You know why? Very little. It's fan neutral. Right, exactly. And, yeah, because either, either power play goal, you know, um, or e- not power play goal, regular regular goal and when a team goes on the power play you know they both both teams are you know and like announced you know um but yeah once once it hit uh four four one i said you know you know screw this i'm going to the, <laughs> I'm going to the florida game and um so uh a fun <laughs> fact for those of you are Blackhawks fans or you're a big fan of Czech players. Uh, Dominic Kubalik's uh, hometown of Plagent is actually home to a uh, famous beer uh, brewery known as uh, Pilsner Urkel. Um, it's been around since 1842. So if you're ever in the Czech Republic and you're a big fan of hockey, uh, I would say if you're going to have a little bit of a cheer and a beer, go make a pilgrimage there. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, it's it. when I switched over to the, uh, the Islanders game, it's uh, that uh, John uh, Paggio. Jean-Gabriel right? Paggio. It's the French. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, there you I'm go. not surprised you can't say it. No. You either have no. or you don't. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. For sure, um, but no, he is his goal um, against against Florida. Um, it used to be. Is this still Var- Varlamov that was in goal? Varlamov, that- hold on a sec. Let me double check. I'm just checking the box score. So anyone watching me, uh, hold on a sec. Yeah, I'm just uploading. Yeah, I'll get you definitive answer. Okay. Just dig it in NHL.com. Yeah, it was Varlamov who he was twenty seven for twenty eight. Oh, and then it was an open net, right? Yeah. What? He had a ninety six point four save percentage. Oh, so he didn't Well oh, I suppose twenty twenty eight divided by twenty seven. No, twenty seven divided by how would, it, it's in, anyway. In save percentage is point nine six four, but I just moved the decimal point two spots over because it's almost close. Mm-hmm. It's the one of the closest to a hundred percent you can get. Yeah, but um, you you said John Cabral Bajo, he did get a goal along with Anthony Bovillier. Oh, Bavilia, that was the other one that that scored. I I, I recall the 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 
Gabriel Pedro go, but not. But I mean, um, I see there's a couple Islanders on. I mean, a couple current Islanders, and uh, I do see. Um, wasn't Cal Clutterbuck a former uh, Minnesota Wild? Yeah, I'm surprised that he's not retired yet. Honestly, <laughs> like, yeah, he, he's well lo- he he's well loved on their bottom roles. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Brock Nelson is a uh, is a uh, UND alumna alumnus. I was gonna just say, is isn't he a Minnesota boy? Because I figured I'd I'd try that out on you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And did and Brassard mm-hmm. used to play for uh, the Senators long before that Zabanajad trade. Yep. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Sometimes I forget Zabanajad played for the Senators. I know it's been so long, and and I'm almost. I know. And it's... we're almost predating ourselves. <laughs> Hockey, hockey changes so fast, man. It's it's crazy. It's like um, it's like the big trade deadline used to be in February. Now, if things really get bad, you start trading guys before. Which I know I'm mentioning this guy's name, but Taylor Hall is likely going to be resigned by the Arizona Coyotes. Which I know I've written about John Chayka, but um. Their owner, Alex Morello, uh, seems to be the one who wants to resign Taylor Hall. And I heard there was a rumor that it was his contract would be worth seven and a half million per year for Taylor Hall if he does stay. Um, that would give the Devils a second round pick in 2021. And if he also held, uh, Arizona win the series and I believe win in the playoffs, then it would become a first rounder or something like that. I got to double check. Yeah. There's so many conditions when it comes to hockey trades, like in football, it's just like this guy for, you know, first, second, third, whatever round pick, you know, and and then that's done. You get the player, player flops, sucks to suck. (laughs) <laughs> you know actually let, let me let me reiterate so it says according to cap friendly uh with the okay the third round pick not this one um what was it? damn it uh the third round pick can upgrade to a second if the coyotes win a playoff round or if taylor hall resigns in arizona so that third round of uh, – what was it? I'm just trying to see what year that is. I know I'm starting to lose my mind, but uh, let's see. Yeah, it would be 2021. And then it says the pick upgrades to a first if Hall resigns and the Coyotes win a playoff round. So that same combo um, would give the Devils a 2021 uh, first. It would be unprotected. Oh, sure. So if it's both, then you get a first. Okay. Yeah, because um, for to clear that first round pick up, and if they advance, that means um, Arizona would not be eligible for that phase two draft lottery. Right. So who? Yeah. So whoever wins the unlucky eights, um, the the winner of the unlucky eights in phase two will be the first overall pick in this year's draft. It's, it's so crazy. Like you just, just the possible like outcomes of that, like you could have like a team like Florida probably who probably deserves the first round, the first, the first pick. Cause like they've never, it's always like, you know, maybe. And then no, you know what I mean? Like it's, Maybe we can do something, and then, and then it's just off a cliff. And like you know, New York, you know, with that, you know, the second pick in the draft, then they get the first pick. You know, you're building that team with young guys, and the funniest, in my opinion, not the funniest, but like the most interesting, I don't know, most, 
interesting, most interesting would be the Canucks. If they got Alexis Lafreniere, oh boy. Ugh. Then you got Pedersen. Oh, am I boring you? I'm sorry. No, I'm not saying I'm not saying that in a bore in a boring way. I'm just saying like just you know, you said Vancouver and that becoming a first overall. I'm like, uh, there goes that extra later round pick in the first round the Devils could have used for a player possibly like Braden Schneider from uh the Wheat Kings. Sure. Yeah. Um now, like if think about it though, like you got Pedersen from two years ago, rook, uh, rookie of the year. Then you got Quinn Hughes, possible rookie of the year. I think he'll get it. I think he's gonna get the Calder. Then you got Alexis Lafreniere, who looks to be next year's rookie of the year, but he could flop, and that would be even funnier because of all the hype that is being built around him. So I do want to <laughs> chime in on that. So like, I know every year, like I, I understood the hype in Matthews and McDavid's. And then I remember the year with Aaron Ekblad and uh, what's his name? Niall Yakupov and Yakupov was so overblown. I couldn't really see the high end potential in him going first overall and I know I'm bringing on another podcast name and spit and chickless and Brian Burke said oh my god one of my guys in the meeting during the draft interview wanted to wring his neck they didn't like him and he and he's like no 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 Morgan Riley would have been our uh first overall pick and they get Riley if I'm correct um, I just got to double check myself on the, uh, what is it, Niall Yakupov draft. Because I just remember listening to that episode on Spit and Chicklets. Uh, yeah, it was Morgan Riley. And look, and look how Morgan Riley's turned out. And Yakupov is a complete bust. And he got traded a couple times already in the KHL where he's originally from. Yeah, I, it's like I said, drafts are just they're just interesting in all in all sports. Like you know, um, like maybe maybe uh, bringing other sports in this, but like maybe Joe Burrow, you know, of of the Bengals won't do as hot as everybody thinks he is. <laughs> or maybe, you know, sad, or, it's like sad the 20, time for the twenty sixteen NBA draft. Um, only only player that is still relevant is Ben Simmons. All the other players are incredibly mediocre. But yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean I I hope Lafreniere you know uh stands up to his his billing. To his hype. It lives up lives up to his hype and and <laughs> and, and I you did see him in both and I, I the... And I'm actually, you know, the thing is, I, I'm on Hockey DB and I'm looking at all these players and I recognize a lot of these names. And some that I didn't think, like Ryan Murray would go second overall and Galchenyuk went third. If I was, if honestly, if I was uh, Montreal, I probably would have picked up Matthew Dumba or even like Cody Cece. I would have I would have gone with guys like that, um, but knowing Bergevin, Bergevin does the way he does, or whoever did at that time. Um, but you you guys came out big on the Matthew Dumba pick at seven. Yeah, absolutely. Dumba has <clears throat> like for the first couple of years he was kind of you know eh he's you know third line second line kind of guy. Right, but now, you know, he's right next. He's well. I shouldn't say it. He's still. He a couple of years ago he was second line, just because uh, Suter and Spurgeon had that chemistry. But now, Dumb was on that first line with with Suter, and then Spurgeon's the one that went down. 
that I'm still upset about that a little bit, mm. but <laughs> it's it's all good. I just I just really like that Suter and Spurgeon chemistry that they had, you know, a couple years back. But it is what it is. Yeah. Um. But yeah, Dumba is just big, big around the league. He's like the hockey version of. Colin Kaepernick almost. He, he's he, he's a really good player, and I I like the way he's, you know, he's done things on his own, and you know, he he's a player that thinks on independently and plays a good style of hockey, and you know, he's going to be a multifaceted personality, and it's it's good that hockey has these minds where the traditional hockey player, you know, is just like. Yes, sir. I I do know that, and you know, answer the question doesn't really have much. But um, other than having a PK Subban with a a highly you know colorful uh, charisma and character, you need more people to have um, more you know characteristics than just you know the average Joe. No, no offense to the average Joe in the NHL. <laughs> Joe, Joe Joe Thornton you're talking uh, about? I mean Joe Thornton's on his own planet I mean he had a he's had a great career and he's playing in the Swiss League no Jumbo Jumbo Joe yeah there you go that's the name right Jumbo Joe um uh one one question I did have for you um so the wild don't have any um they don't have any uh, players in the Hockey Hall of Fame. All right. Now, Madonna, I, I would hope, is in the Hall of Fame. I'm, I don't, oh, sorry, don't oh, have sorry. that fact right in my head right now. I think he is. But, but technically, he's a star, right? He went in under Dallas. Right. Uh, yeah. I'm just actually double-checking. And you know what? Like, I know this is Major League Baseball, but – they do have like coaches and players, et cetera, that have, you know, like multiple teams listed that they played for or were associated with. They usually do that. And I think the NHL should have done that um, because like when they do get um, what's his name in eventually, uh, what's his name? Alexander McGilney, you know, they should have multiple mm teams listed because he was such a great player for a lot of those teams in his prime. Well, see the, the football hall of fame does that too. You know, like, um, Randy Moss. Okay. He played for the Vikings. He played for the Patriots. He played for the 49ers, the Patriots. From what I remember, um, let's say, yeah. Uh, well, I think the reason why Mike Madano wasn't classified with Minnesota is because majority of his career after he left Minnesota is that he put up a lot of those prime time numbers with Dallas. And if I recall correctly, yeah, he did win a championship with Dallas. I, that you are right. Right. It was in so 2000, was 2001, but he did hurt. He did, you know, win a double double no, or triple overtime yeah. at the old Brennan Burn Arena. Uh, I really don't want to elaborate on that because, you know, a lot of the people listening are usually doubles fans and, you know, uh, stuff like that they don't want to think about, but it's just, you know, it's just life. But the mm. Devils did win that Stanley Cup the year before Dallas eventually won it. So um, Craig Button is – he was their GM, if I recall correctly. Um, when they were with Minnesota and Dallas, mm. uh, it's it's past my time. I'm more of like a tens to twenties hockey guy. You know, I'm wasn't even born when <laughs> that, when that was around. So you're 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 talking Greek, I'm talking Greek. But, I um, I can't speak Greek. <laughs> Good luck with that one. <laughs> Uh, but um, uh, so I, I, back back to my question. Um, <laughs> we got sidetracked. Who is the who has the most likely chance 
to get in the Hockey Hall of Fame for the Minnesota Wild? Well, I don't know the Minnesota Wild very closely, but I'm just going to double check what, uh, let's see, possible Minnesota Wild Hockey Hall of Fame candidates. And I'll see if I agree. Um, Let's see. This is an article by puckpros.com. And I'll see if I agree with them. Um, one sec. Got you. Well, see, I was kind of just thinking, like, off the top of your head. Uh, well, like I said, I – Like, Parisi, Suter. I honestly um, think Parise could get in, but at the same time, a lot of his years, his best years were with New Jersey. And I'm not just saying that as a Devils fan, but I'm saying it as – someone who saw a lot of his good years um, in New Jersey. Um, well, he did have his highest highest scoring year in Minnesota. So I don't know if you can really say yeah. that. But I, I do think, I do think that like the, 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 like his prime, you know, like his prime prime, um, I think it was like the two years before he went to Minnesota and then the three years after he came to Minnesota – that that was kind of his prime. So it was, it was, you know, when he was in New Jersey, and then he just kind of found, you know, found a new home, and then he. It, it wasn't technically a new really, home, new home. It was more like a his no, his native home, new, new home. If that makes sense, right? Um, I I can see it being Suter right. more. Yeah, because I, I think Suter just kind of does the all the little things right. Like he um, like he's been one of the most stable defensemen that they've had for a while. Um, but if you're talking just yeah, numbers, absolutely. it could it, it, you could have both players likely try and vie for the Hall of Fame, but they're not going to be first ballot. They're likely going to be third or fifth time. No. No. Who is who is um. Like Wayne Gretzky's Tom Wilson, like you know how like you know how um, I'm trying to remember is to, uh, he Tom Wilson is the question as blank because is to um, he had Yari there. Curry and I forgot I forgot who his his physical guy was. Yeah, I. <laughs> Uh, I, I can't off the top of my head either. So yeah. That's why the, I asked you. Oh, it, you know, guy it was like Dave Semenko. You know. yep. Semenko died at 59 yep. years old. It, the article was written by C, oh, by I, CTV News. Um, the Canadian Press uh, published it uh, June 29th of 2017. Said Dave Semenko, who defined hockey's tough guy role as Wayne Gretzky's bodyguard and once went three pound three rounds with boxing legend Muhammad Ali. Uh, he died with a battle of cancer. Okay, that's that's probably why they put him in then because they. I, I don't know. I think the. I don't want to get too political, so I'm only going to give this like thirty seconds. But I think the NHL is kind of liberal. I think stuff like oh, he died. I wouldn't use the term liberal. I would use the term progressive. Meanwhile, I find the NFL to be more conservative, and I think that's why certain people are attracted to certain uh, organizations and teams. But um, you know, everyone everyone's style is a little bit different, but. not trying to get off topic, but that's that's the end of that no, portion. <laughs> I don't like talking politics on yeah, sports, like really, I said, unless we're talking uh, no, like USSR. <laughs> unless we're talking Herb Brooks. Oh, good. Herb Brooks, St. Cloud, Minnesota native. That's where I grew up. Spent a lot of time at the at the Herb Brooks National Hockey Center watching some St. Cloud State hockey. Um, yeah, so that's. It's real homey to me. I, but... I like Herb Brooks. I like <laughs> he he did coach Absolutely. his doubles. So, so does all of America. <laughs> he he did all of America likes Herb Brooks there, Joe. I was gonna Come yeah, on. I was gonna you say, well Herb. I mean team wise Russia and then you know, I did have someone on, you know, not long ago who was at that game as a photographer. 
His name was Dan Carubia, and he actually photographed um, the Team USA hockey team in Lake Placid. So um, my my fa- my family, my parents at the time were living in upstate New York. So that was a huge time, you know, in the nation's uh, psyche where a lot of things were going wrong, you know, in the public eye and beating the Russians, then eventually winning against the Finns for the gold medal was, you know, a great field story. Um, what will be the great field story mm-hmm. uh, going forward when COVID-19 ends is fans getting back to sitting in the stands. Yeah. It's even if it's, you know, a, 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 you know, 10% of, you know, the, the seating, right. What's, what's the capacity of the, uh, of the Prudential the Center, Center, I don't even know. I don't even it, know. Prudential, it's yeah. typically seventeen thousand six hundred twenty-five, um, unless they add seating, um, which I could see that, but um, it's still pretty tight knit. Um, usually, still so seven, limiting it to maybe two thousand fans. Uh, you know, I mean, here's the thing: if you're gonna do the six feet the six foot rule in the state of New Jersey, um, it has to be no more than 25 people uh, or under a hundred uh, in the state of New Jersey. So yeah, I mean, most of the people would have to do those car- stupid cardboard cutouts if they had to do some funding um, to make up the difference if there's no vaccine. So I, that's as far as I'm going to go on that subject, but um, I just, I was looking at the Mets, and I just didn't like the cutouts. I just I just think it's silly, and I think it's a waste of money. Yeah, Chicago's doing it too. With the Twins, um, the which you know Chicago's just doing regular cutouts. It's, um, uh, Spike, not Spike Lee. Um, uh, there's, there's an actor, there's a, there's a musician that, um, that, uh, got, got a cutout, and it's right, right in front, right in front there. <laughs> um, and you know, big, big spiky white hair. Uh, I can't think of any celebrities of right Love now, you. um, that are in that uh, description. They, but um, what the, what the what they're doing they're doing big heads and like next month um well this month august um you can order one for eighty dollars <laughs> and get it scanned. um but otherwise it's just former former twins players um and we are getting really off yeah i was gonna say you know, the, to i was gonna say it's not as bad as um uh, so it's not last- as bad as some other podcasts i've listened to where it gets to it gets sure. totally off the rails but um, I was thinking about um, how St. Louis is still the reigning champ in the, for the Stanley Cup. Um, they're down one and nothing. What do you think from a wild st- standpoint, you can see them coming back or making a name for themselves again? Um, well, as a wild fan, right, I want – everyone in the central division to like to get to line up and just 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 get hit by a bus. <laughs> not that I want but speaking more seriously um when it comes to when it comes to that game um I don't know my buddy is a he's a avalanche fan you know I mean I I, I have respect for you know Bennington and um uh, Tarasenko, uh, oh my God, who Petrangelo? I mean, you, you, all, pro- you know, all those guys, you know, like the the, the talented guys, Miko Rantanen. Um, well, Miko Rantanen is a, a Colorado Avalanche. Yeah, but I know. I'm talking about the game though, like the you know the Colorado St. Louis game yesterday, right? Rantanen, um. Why can't I think of players' names right now? 
I just think uh, there's so much hockey consumed that your brain's probably overloaded, kind of like how mine does at times. Yeah. The, the the listeners know who we're talking about. You know, the big three, the big three in, in, in Colorado. and then, Oh, McKinnon, Landeskog, um, and Ratman. McKinnon. Yes, those three. And then you got Kale McCarr, you know, uh, my buddy. Um, he said that uh, Kale McCarr is playing like he's 30 years old in terms of how good he is. He's playing like a veteran. Even though he's what nineteen? Yeah, he's straight. He came straight out of UMass Amherst uh, in his first like couple of games, and he just really let the world on fire. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I think if it's not going to be Quentin Hughes for the it, it's for the call, then it's going to be McCarr. It's de- it, it, no, McCarr's the second year. Well, he- like I I said earlier. Yeah. Um, Dave McCarthy does believe it's going to be slight, slightly in the favor of Kale McCarr because he's just so good naturally. And Quinn Hughes, you know, makes the plays and makes the effort um, for his team. But they also have a lot of really good players as well. But I still believe that McCarr is one of those guys that it just – it's always beast mode for him um, when he gets on the ice. You know who else went beast mode yesterday? Just last thing I want to talk about, Kadri. Don't know Nazem name. Kadri. Yeah, that's why I don't know his first name. It's not <laughs> um, your typical name. <laughs> it's not your typical name. Uh, Kadri, he... Boy... That was crazy yesterday. 0.1 seconds left to win the game. Save the best for last for the pod, you know. Um, (laughs) 0.1 seconds. And it was like a redirect. And then just Kadri was just there. And he just puts it back in. I'm thinking it'd be like a through the five hole or something with like three seconds left. Bounce off. Nobody knows where the puck is for like a solid two seconds. Kadji's right there. Boom. Puts it right in. Nobody knows what's going on. Five minutes of deliberation. And the angle that we see is not the angle that the ref saw. But when the camera was on the tablet, right, it uh, it had to cross the goal line. You could see that there was a little bit of white. Yeah, there's a little bit of white ice on the tablet that you could see. And then it was it was clear and obvious. So that, that was exciting. I uh, That's actually the first buzzer beater I think I've seen. You know, you see videos of it, but like a live game that you see. Yeah, it's it's just it's rare. Yeah, <laughs> it's like Ninety nine percent of the time, you don't see those kinds of buzzer beaters in the game. But this is why you play every last second because you just don't know the the bounce. And I remember when Taylor Hall would play in New Jersey. There were there was a time where he would get in on from the wing and he would come and play from the faceoff circle, go straight in on the point, and he would snipe it in and it would go right on like top right corner or something like that and the goalie would be lost because he was screened so these are the kind of things that makes Mm -hmm. hockey so special where you think your defense is gonna help you get out of these little uh clear me out type situations but it's just that one little letdown or that little bit of ice that is not completely taken up yeah, it, it'll happen. But you know what? Uh, well, Rask probably not Rask. Rene probably could have stopped that uh, that one goal uh, that bounced off Duchesne. You know, like the you know those unpredictable goals like you're talking about. You know, only a couple seconds left. But you know, just over the shoulder. 
that was really old as shoulder. <laughs> that uh, that Duchesne own goal, I guess. Is that what? It, is that what you classify it as? I didn't see it, but I'm trying to watch it now to see um, how it how it turned out, and just just yeah, seeing. It's, it's hard to. Like I did see in the Carolina game that um, I think it was Justin Williams or someone took a nice shot off of a Ranger and it went skate in or something right in to the goal. Um, Just looking at this gif Mm -hmm. from that game last night. uh, What happened was on the play is um, one of the guys went for like a, it looked like a power play type goal yeah it was a power play it was a it was a fake shot pass that went uh from west to east and Kadri is ready waiting by the wings on the top of the crease um 96 is waiting to see the rebound and Kadri steps right in and does a hockey version of a bunt in and it goes right in Oh, we're talking about the um that other one, the uh the Kadri okay. winner. Yeah, that yeah, the Kadri winner. Yeah. That yeah, that was that was crazy. And uh yeah, the um at Nashville um Nashville, Arizona goal, like bounced off a stick and then bounced off Duchesne. Went over Saros and in. You, that's never gonna happen. Yeah, you you usually don't see those types of plays, but I tell you, players now are more athletic than ever, and this is why, you know, hockey's like a mixture of football, basketball, rugby, and baseball in one. It's just like the perfect cocktail. There you go. It, that's what it simply is. is It's a cocktail of everything. Um, so I wanted to touch on what are you writing on or have written about on the Puck Authority. Uh, I wrote uh, the Game 1 recap of the Wild and Canucks game. Uh, published uh, 4 o'clock today. Four o'clock on like eight, on April third. Um, so if you want to check it, check that out. Um, otherwise, if you want to follow me on Twitter, um, P W A N twenty twenty. Yeah, I usually post all my all my uh, articles on there. And um, and I yeah. did my um, my recent article was uh, my my first uh, eleven thoughts and ideas. Um, I'll kind of give it away a little bit. Um, One of being, you know, the outcomes of the conditional picks, a little bit about John Chaika. Um, Then I have a part two coming out, and it's going to be more diversified with um, other teams that uh, we just talked about earlier. I just go a little bit more in depth um, on those other teams. So there's 11 – thoughts and ideas in each uh, bulletin. Yeah. There you go. I I did read that. That was that was interesting. It was like one of the one of the ones that was published in the in the, the, the morning. So it was like one of the first ones because I was waiting to see if mine got published in the morning. Yeah. They're waiting the afternoon. Usually when Justin uh, finishes up the edits is usually up by 10 45 in the morning. So, uh, well, I do see your wild beat Canucks three, nothing in game one. So that's a pretty interesting one. And I do see the Seattle crack and expansion one. Um, I know, I think we did touch on that a little bit. Um, before we go, I want to touch up on, on the Seattle crack in a little bit. Um, what do you, what do you think? I think the logo is really underwhelming. I think the jersey is ugly. <laughs> uh, I think there's a lot of potential. To that. Um, I think the logo looks like Suzuki, Suzuki motor, uh, motorcycles. If you look at that, it looks just like yeah. that. Um, 
I don't know. I think um, it's. Uh, I, I I don't like it. <laughs> just to so you feel jealous, um, and they're given. No, the the opposite. I'm envious. <laughs> no, not envious. I'm. Um, not envious. What's the op? What's the opposite of envy? Not envying. Grace. <laughs> I don't know. But I grateful that that's not my logo. <laughs> Yeah, something like it's, that. It's, it, um, I don't know. It's 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 an S. It's very, it's very basic. Um, there's no. It's not very sophisticated. <laughs> um, well, because take a look at the. There's the, a bit of a wave the in Vegas there, logo. showing the tentacle coming right up. Uh, I didn't say the other word, but <laughs> you got to look. But I, the it, you got to look at it real hard before you can. It took me like three times before I actually saw that. But I asked all my coworkers what they thought. Like this happened like right when it came out, right? I just, you know, found the logo, and and the jersey. Like, hey, what's your opinion on this new NHL team? Like, what do you think of their, what do you think of their design? And all, you know, three of them, all three of them said, uh, eh, whatever. It, eh. And then I showed them the Vegas logo. Right now, let me get your opinion on this logo. You know, three years, three, four years old, but still. Um, this is the helmet of a knight, and look closely, makes a V, you know, where there's not a helmet, right? And it's very, it's very, very sophisticated. And it's very, you know, there's more, more than one thing within the logo, right? But that's, that's what should happen, you know, right when you look at it. What okay. here's here not to interrupt, but yeah, um, was. what I see in the logo is I see I see the head with I see like a red tongue. I see the the tentacle with the waves showing it coming right up. Um, I see the uh, the tentacles in the back, and I do see it making some movements. I believe. With Vancouver saying they they weren't allowed to take the the green and the uh, blue from Vancouver, they were only allowed to really come up with so much that they could have for the first ever logo and design. I think over time the evolution of the logo will become something a little bit more improved, like. Um, when the Devils first came from Colorado in the relocation in 82, um, the NJ um, was a little bit more, you know, red and white. And then there was like a logo that was like red, white, and green. And then it started to evolve over time with the old graphic design back in the 80s. So usually every five to eight to ten years there comes a new concept well the initial rendering right it had um a an octopus or a kraken tentacle right wrapped around the space needle and it, there wasn't too much detail but there's enough detail to know those you know what was going on right and it's like oh i get it they're the kraken and they're from Seattle. That's it, you know? But they, this, it's just, there's too much thought into it. And there's too many, like, minor details. And that's just what makes it a bad logo, in my opinion. I'm, I do know that they're coming out with a uh, third jersey. And I'm looking at the original, like, what would have been, like, the... I would call it the fighting Irish green and gold. I think that would have been pretty interesting if they could have gone with that scheme. I just think they were restricted to certain designs, but I do like the S it's supposed to take after the original uh, first American Stanley cup winners in the, uh, the Seattle metropolitan. So there's a little bit of the history with that. So there's a little bit of DNA from that. 
and I like and I do like the anchor. Well, yeah. It, the the secondary logo, the anchor on, on the top. There's the Seattle Space Needle. I do like that. I do. I think that's good. And I would actually be interested in going out to Seattle watching watching a game. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> is yeah, it's it's not like you're spending a lot of money in Vancouver. No, right? It, it's just uh, I don't know. I, I I I'd like to go see him in when they come to Minnesota, but I don't know. But I'm going to go to Seattle. Drink all the coffee I can. <laughs> yeah. I, I was, I was going to say, if they weren't the, the Kraken, I would call them the Seattle Baristas because of Starbucks and, uh, and Howard Schultz. So I, I think that is as close to off topic we'll be. Um, I think we did a pretty good job with this, uh, this recap of the first two days of, uh, the NHL coming back. Um, so Parker, anything else you want to add before we wrap it up? Um, no, just check out, check out my Twitter, PWAN 2020. Um, yeah, give me a follow. That's, that's, that's all I got. All right, everyone have a great evening and, um, Enjoy enjoy the rest of your week. All right. All right. See, you, see you later.